Hey guys, so this week I read, watched, and listened to over a hundred articles, podcasts, videos, you name it, on the Evergrande crisis, so you don't have to. My goal in this video is to give you the general ideas of what's happening in a fun, entertaining way, so you have some things to think about when considering your investment strategy. But before I get into it, you know the drill. Please like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. My goal is to get to 10,000 subscribers by the end of this year, and my goodness, we are getting close. So let's start this story off with the Jim Chanos, Charlie Rose interview from almost a day decade ago. So for them to get off of stopping construction, you'll see GDP growth go negative very quickly. That's not going to happen because in China, it's, as we say, it's all about making the number. People are rewarded at almost every level of government of making their economic growth numbers. The easiest way to do that is put up another building. So that video dates back to 2012. And at that time, you could go on YouTube and see dozens of videos of what I'd like to call ghost malls and buildings where the shell of a building or tower was created but when you looked inside, there were barely any signs of human life. So if we're gonna break this crisis down, we're gonna talk about three main buckets here. One, the Chinese economy and real estate. Two, Evergrande itself. And three, the global economy. Bucket one, the Chinese economy and real estate. So this story begins in the late 1980s. Now remember, China is a communist state, which makes funding housing projects and general infrastructure problems a challenge. Former premier Zhao Jing wrote in his memoirs, it was perhaps 1985 or 1986 when I talked to Yao Yingdong, a Hong Kong tycoon better known as Henry Falk, and mentioned that we didn't have funds for urban development. He asked me, if you have land, how can you not have money? I thought this was a strange comment. Having land was one issue, a lack of funds was another. What did the two have to do with one another, he said. If municipalities have land, they should get permission to lease some of it, bring in some income, and let some other people develop the land. Indeed, I had noticed how in Hong Kong, buildings and streets were constructed quickly. A place could be quickly transformed, but for us, it was very difficult. So in a great piece by Mark Rubenstein over at Epsilon Theory, we learned that in 1988, the Chinese government changed the constitution to allow rights to use land, not ownership, but to be bought and sold under long-term leases, or as Rubenstein refers to it, a fudge. How this would work was residential deals would come with a 70-year lease and commercial deals would come with a 50-year lease. And just like that, China found itself with a new economic growth driver. Okay, so this turned into more than just an economic driver. It turned into a serious self-funding machine for the government. So from 2009 to 2015, the Chinese government collected around 22 trillion yuan, or that's approximately US $3 trillion, simply selling land leases to private enterprises. This allowed the government to fund massive infrastructure investment on a scale that the taxpayer wouldn't have been able to fund otherwise. In the decades that followed, China had an economy roaring thanks to rising real estate prices driven by a banking sector willing and able to lend and citizens eager to invest in bricks and mortar. But the real estate market did more than just roar. It became a national pastime. It became the driver of the economy and even got to a level that didn't make sense. For example, the Financial Times tells us that there is enough empty property in China to house 90 million people. To put that in perspective, China could safely house two Canadas. In a paper by Harvard economics professor Kenneth Rogoff, he tells us, with real estate production and property services accounting for 29% of GDP, rivaling Ireland and Spain at their pre-financial crisis peaks, it is hard to see how a significant slowdown in the Chinese economy can be avoided even if banking problems were contained. There's various problems that can occur when an economy uh, that's built on real estate prices simply spirals out of control. It can have an impact on the prosperity of the people. For example, China has a declining birth rate with an average of 1.3 births per female. However, in order to sustain a population, that birth rate needs to be at a steady 2.1. It wouldn't be unfair to suggest the reason for the dwindling population has been decreasing housing affordability which has prevented Chinese men from moving out of their parents' dwelling and buying a home of their own. Aside from that, a major problem with an economy largely dependent on real estate and real estate-related services is the misallocation of capital. As newly famous Twitter macro guy and food lover in Arte Carlo Das tells us, as a result of years of seeking easy growth through construction and leverage, the misallocation of capital was one, capital starving more innovative and high-tech sectors, and two, creating a headwind for a rebalancing towards a more consumption-driven growth. So this brings us to Xi Jinping's move towards a focus on common prosperity. Thinking about how 600 million Chinese have a monthly income of 160 US dollars or less and having asset prices not match those real wages, Xi decided it's time to rein in the real estate sector and he introduces the three red lines. Under this guideline, developers would need to have 
liabilities to assets no higher than 70%, net debt to equity no higher than 100%, and cash to short-term debt higher than 100%. And in the event developers failed to meet any of the three red lines, regulators would then place limits on their access to new debt. And just like that, a company named Evergrande found themselves in a precarious position. Bucket two, Evergrande. Evergrande was started in 1996 by Hua Kayan, initially called Hengda Group. Their core business was simple, lease land, develop housing and buildings, and sell it to owners and investors. The company went public on the New York Stock Exchange in 2009, and at that time they had 55 million square meters of total land reserve, a great pipeline of projects. In the year prior, they only had developed around 5.6 million square meters of the 55 million in the pipeline. And as we all know, when it comes to raising money, storytelling is everything. Just look at that pipeline. Bankers were calling it the McDonald's of Chinese real estate. The company raised 722 million US dollars in their IPO, which was massively oversubscribed, and the stock popped 33% on its first day of trading. Evergrande then used these funds to clean up their balance sheet and grab more land. They planned to build many cities that could accommodate up to 65,000 people on a single site. And by the end of the first year, they found themselves with a land bank that had grown by 75% and significantly more cash from raising debt and selling pre-builds. Then in 2012, the company saw this pesky bastard known as Andrew Left from Citron Research put out a short report on the company. Their 57-page report claimed that Evergrande was insolvent. Specifically, it claimed that they used at least six accounting shenanigans, were bribing government officials, and created a complex web of Ponzi-like financing schemes. My favorite part of the report is when they call out Wee for his honorary doctorate from the University of West Alabama, which was given to him in 2008 as part of winning the World Outstanding Chinese Award. I did look up the University of West Alabama, and for what it's worth, it turns out that it's a totally real school, but all of their notable alumni are pretty much football players. But here's the point, is that the company marketed Wee as a doctor and professor at the Wuhan University of Science and Technology, which Citron sources actually said was totally untrue. As you can imagine, the higher powers of China didn't take kindly to this report. Mr. Left received a five-year suspension from trade in Hong Kong, which appears to be up next month. The company employs around 200,000 people, with reports suggesting that they hire as many as 4 million workers a year through subcontractors. They own more than 1,300 projects in more than 280 cities, and they have over $300 billion in debt. Lastly, research firm Capital Economics estimates that Evergrande has sold around 1.4 million apartments, worth around 200 billion US dollars that it hasn't yet completed. So let's move forward to today. If we look at Evergrande's annual filings, which I did because I'm a total masochist, as of December 31st, 2020, liabilities to assets sit at 82%, well above that red line of 70%. Net gearing defined as borrowing to total equity sits at about 204%, above that red line of 100%. And if we look at the short-term cash to short-term borrowing, Evergrande sits at 47%, which is well below that 100% threshold. And just like that, Evergrande has crossed all three red lines. The company does various things outside of real estate development. They have an electric vehicle division, they own amusement parks, a professional soccer team, a mineral water company, a media company, and even dabble in healthcare. So the company is sort of a Ponzi-like scheme in that they bring in cash from various parties to pay off other parties, all as part of a business model that fails to consistently generate enough free cash flow to sustain itself. So if that's how you want to define a Ponzi-like scheme, well, I guess it's a Ponzi-like scheme. Looking at the roster businesses that they surround, it's not unreasonable to suspect a great deal of these ventures were about raising capital and not really about the operating business, which is what you have to do when you're an over-leveraged real estate company with a lengthy cash conversion cycle and an inability to take on more debt. So in 2019, the company started offering wealth management products, which I suppose theoretically is a great idea to try to match your long-term borrowing with your short-term cash inflow needs. But of course, as you would su suspect with Evergrande, they overpromised with up to 12% yields, coupled with gifts such as Dyson air purifiers and Gucci bags. And heck, you know what? It even worked. They managed to lure in 80,000 investors for these products, many of which were employees or family members of employees. And today we're getting lots of stories about how they fear they're never going to get paid back. The greasy part of this story is that we have a company that clearly crossed the red lines of leverage, yet as recently as this year, Evergrande was raising money while attempting to pay directors dividends. Forbes reports that we has been paid out $8 billion in dividends since the company first went public in 2009. And even more shockingly, Evergrande attempted to issue a special dividend for 2021, claiming it would increase interest in the share price, which they ended up canceling on July 27th. So the company's near-term cash needs for servicing both its onshore and offshore debt is give or take over 700 million US dollars. Of course, we assume the onshore debt holders are gonna get paid first, as has been the case thus far. This is where we get to the third bucket. 
Bucket three, the global economy. Will there be contagion? Hey, hey, slow down. I'm just a YouTube guy. I spend my free hours watching Blue Jays baseball and eating Taco Bell. What do I know? Okay, fine. I'll take the bait. We have to think about this first domestically and then globally. So domestically, the government has come out and said no more further excessive real estate borrowing with that whole three red line policy. And this is really interesting because according to Goldman Sachs, the total value of Chinese homes and developers inventory hit 52 trillion US dollars in 2019, which is about twice the size of the US residential market. Now, whenever there's a housing bubble, one of the first concerns we all turn to is the shadow banking system, which is a private lending system where borrowers use overvalued and bad real estate collateral to take on more debt in a largely unregulated high yield fashion. Some have suggested that the Chinese shadow banking system is largely comprised of billionaires and stolen funds from bureaucrats, which then get levered via fractional reserve banking. We've also learned that retail investors in China were participating in this shadow banking system as well. For example, Evergrande Wealth, which sold the company's wealth management product, we're talking about 80,000 clients here, is considered part of the shadow banking system. And this system has the potential to be a canary in the coal mine given a sideways or declining real estate market if it is as out of control as many believe, but let's save that for another video. This reminds some of us of Japan. In a great piece over at the Financial Times by Jillian Tett, she compares Evergrande's failure to that of regional bank Hokkaido Takushoku when more than one-tenth of the loans went bad in their $75 billion portfolio. It is her belief that there's two things that hold up asset prices. One, government support, and two, scrutiny by investors. So when the Japanese real estate bubble bursted in the early 1990s, despite suspicions of bad loans, there wasn't much initial panic. This was because the pillar of government support still existed. But then in 1997, the Bank of Japan declared it was impossible for this company to meet its funding requirements. And just like that, confidence disappeared faster than a tray of delicious sushi presented to small cap Steve. Jim Chanos tells us that this actually may be worse than the Lehman Brothers catastrophe. In many ways, you don't have to worry that it's a Lehman type situation, but in many others, it's far worse because it's symptomatic of the whole economic model and the debt that's behind the economic model. So another famous short seller, Kyle Bass, tells us that this isn't about G propping up the stock market. It's actually about those 600 million people that live below the poverty line, possibly revolting against the government. The capital injected into them. We're talking about one company in China having $300 billion of defaults coming their way. And all the banks in China are much more levered as a percentage of GDP than U.S. banks were going into our own financial crisis. So I think China's is on the precipice of a real big economic uh, problem. And I think that it will come back to bite uh, Xi Jinping and his administration. But what's I think what he's really focused on is what's happening even here. When the central banks print money like it's the national pastime, you get, you get uh, an economy that's completely out of whack, right? So you have asset prices ripping and you don't have wages going anywhere near there. So you have, you have uh, real wages declining uh, for the middle class and the poor. And that, that would spell the end of Xi Jinping's uh, administration if all of a sudden that got to a place where we got like the Arab Spring and you get food prices moving 45% in the last seven or eight months. I think he's playing a much bigger game than worried about his stock market. Mm. I think he's worried about his existence as, as the uh, call it premier for life. If we look at China's main imports, we see integrated circuits, crude petroleum, iron ore, and gold at the top. Now, already we're starting to see some cracks appear if we look at the price chart of iron ore, which is one of the key materials used in real estate construction. What about the owners of Evergrande's offshore debt? Well, we must shed a tear for those fund managers and high net worth individuals who are likely to be begged by those raspy devils over at Credit Suisse. I just wanted the yield! Who, of course, earlier this year brought us the whole Billy Wong Archegos debacle. It's well known that HSBC and BlackRock both have taken hits from the offshore bonds, with some rumors starting to swirl that HSBC may have even issued billions of dollars in mortgages to Chinese buyers of Evergrande property. Jason Burek over at his YouTube channel suggested in a video that he had private conversations with Kyle Bass and there's talk that HSBC stock could go to zero. So look, China is the second largest economy in the world. They do over $2 trillion in trades, both in terms of exports and imports. It would be foolish to suggest there won't be contagion. Many of these trades occur in US dollars, which could affect both money markets, banks, and suppliers around the globe as velocity slows down. Heck, there is even an outside chance that all that real estate various Chinese citizens have acquired internationally could be sold off and repatriated to bring US dollars back to China. Don't put anything past President Xi Jinping. Guys, thanks for watching this video. I know it was a long one. Please let us know in the comments what you think. 
like, subscribe, ring that notification bell. You know the drill. Thank you, everybody.